students. Um, I tell them, look, I'm sorry, I can't go around to every house, but I'm glad that they understand. And they thank me for what I've done, but I remind them it's not the task force alone, it's all of us working together. But are you able to, to balance and juggle your, your time in between? Um, I, I understand we're having some problems with the audio feed. Uh, we're trying to sort that out at the moment, uh, but we, we, will, uh, we will do so. And thank you for staying with us as we uh, talk about our rally. Please keep your comments coming. Uh, we will try to fix the audio feed as soon as possible. Uh, our apologies. So Lawrence, uh, have you been able to, to juggle the responsibilities of the task force and the campaign or have you had to rely on your colleagues? Well, you know, coincidentally one of my colleagues was out of action for a while too because she had a fall and she injured her Hi, leg. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah. So they are doing their part, they are trying their very best to you know, go out and campaign. Um, like I said, Priorities on the task force work. Whatever spare time I have, I go out to meet my residents. So I do it to the best of my capabilities. They understand. Yeah, but this uh, COVID nineteen fight, um, you know, uh, uh, the numbers came down. The cases look like we're under control. Were we too worried? Were we too worried when? When you 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 sort of made that ministerial statement and. Oh. At that time, I think we've all been very we, worried for <laughs> quite a long time. We, we remain worried even today. Yeah. You know, one of the biggest questions, one of the questions everyone has been asking me is when will phase three start? Yeah. And I keep reminding them we have to really take this very cautiously because if you look at the situation around the world, um, almost all the countries that have exited from their lockdowns yeah. have seen the virus flare up again. Yeah. And you've seen uh, Victoria State in Australia, Melbourne just got into a six-week lockdown. Yes, Israel just yes, reintroduced indeed. a lockdown. So you've been worried throughout <laughs> this period, okay? Um, yeah. Because our whole aim and objective is to keep the con virus, keep the infection under control. Yeah. Do not allow it to flare up, overwhelm our healthcare system. Precisely because we've seen the experience elsewhere when it overwhelms the hospital system. People do not get the care they need and many people die, yeah. especially the vulnerable seniors. And we really want to protect every Singaporean. Absolutely. So, um, thank you. I, I understand the audio has been fixed now. Uh, those of you who are logging on and giving us a live quality check, thank you very much uh, uh, for staying with us. Um, Lawrence was telling us about his experiences uh, on the ground and how residents have been talking about COVID-19. Mm -hmm why we've been so worried about uh, the situation thus far. Uh, we'll, re we'll return to, to COVID-19. I think it's something that's been on the mind of quite a lot of my residents. Um, and, and it's something that we probably should spend some time some talking about. Sure. But um, have there been other issues uh, that our residents have been most concerned about? Well, I, I suggest PM. Jobs please. are really on top of everybody's minds because, mm. because of COVID-19, the economy mm. is down. People can't go to work and many people are earning less and some of them have actually lost jobs. Yeah. And uh, they are concerned when you go around and meet people, they will talk to you and they are very supportive, but at the same time you can tell they are concerned. And I've met people who have said, I, I lost my job. I said, well, but have you found another one? He said, yes, I have found another one, but it's not quite as good as the previous one. It pays noticeably less. And I, I, I mean, I'm struggling a bit. And this is somebody who was in his 50s. It's the group which we have focused on because we know they have the most difficulties because they've got kids they're still looking after. They've got probably old folks at home who need medical care and whom they're supporting now. And if their jobs are affected, it's going to be uh, a significant hit on them. And that's why a lot of our schemes are targeted at them. So I talked to him, I said, well, we have schemes, please take advantage of them. And I hope he'll follow up. We have his particulars and we will get in touch with him. Nice. The, the PM, the young graduates too, I mm. think, are very concerned. I've mm. met yes. parents, I met one parent, yes. the daughter just graduated from NTU mm. with an engineering degree, no less, and I was surprised. Yeah. There's been some months and yeah. the daughter has some difficulties finding a job. Yeah. Ha has, not a fresh yet, has, not yet, has not yet found a job. Has not yet found a job. And so again, I mentioned, we, we, f we know that there are young people, fresh entrants to the workforce, potentially very concerned about this situation. Mm. And that's why in the budget, we've talked about jobs, we've talked about traineeships, attachments that are available. And again, we, 
link, bring, link them up to these opportunities. Do you, do you think that in your uh, campaigning and in meeting your residents, that jobs are the number one thing that they're worried about? Or is, is that on top of their minds? It's certainly one of Jobs the and incomes. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. even if you're in the job, you're not sure yes. whether you're going to keep it. And also, your income probably has been mm. affected. And there have been people who have come to see me to say thank you very much because uh, there's this income support and that's uh, tided me over. But there have also been others who haven't quite met the cutoff. And they say, well, I applied but I didn't get it. So I'll say, we'll have a look at it again and try and see whether you, you qualify some way or other. But I, uh, people are very practical. These are things on their minds and really the things which any leader, any government of Singapore must now focus on once the elections are over. Which is one of the reasons why I decided to call the elections now, so that we can clear our minds and focus on these big things which everybody considers important and which are in fact the key issues in front of Singapore now. Yeah, Yen Ling, has that been your experience on the ground, You're going through the campaign? What, is, what have people brought up to you as yeah. their priorities? In the last two weeks, I mean, uh, as phase two we open up, I've been meeting my residents and of course in the last nine days, very intensive house visits uh, with residents. Well, um, certainly jobs, I think uh, job stability and security, that's really front and centre of everybody's mind. Not just the uh, mid-career job seekers, mid-career hires, even people who are in the job. They worry mm -hmm. whether the job will be there tomorrow, yeah. next month or so, especially if they are the sole breadwinner in the family. And uh, parents who have children graduating from polytechnics or AU or even ITE, they wonder whether uh, their kids' um, uh, career will be derailed by COVID-19. Actually, there's another group. I meet a lot of our traders, our merchants in the HDB heartland. They are so pretty concerned. Um, they are happy now that the coffee shops and the HDB shops are resuming business. But I think they are worried about uh, how can um, you know the business continue to grow, yeah. and of course mm. SMEs as yeah, well. And I had one whose whose who's, uh, stall in the hawker centre is fine, but she said to me, "I have a pub. Oh. When oh can my pub open?" Oh dear! I said, "I'll ask Lawrence." <laughs> <laughs> I'm I said, not sure that I can give her a very good news. Uh, so I told her, "I'm sorry, it's very tough because you know, here you're serving food, people eat peacefully." It's safe. You go to the pub, people drink and carouse. That's when the virus spreads very rapidly. There is loud music and they speak loudly. Yes. I think that's very dangerous. So yes. that's in much so later. So phase. she understood me, but she's hurting. Mm. I mean, we're giving her relief, uh, things to help with her yeah. sal salaries and so on, but it's still painful. Mm. For sure. Maybe I can just ask Nadia, is that your sense? I mean, are people largely understanding of the need for these types of restrictions? Do they have the same fears around COVID-19? and accept the impact that's happening at, to yeah. their jobs and their businesses? Um, maybe, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll share two points. I mean, number one, I really wanted to add on to what um, Lynn Lawrence shared about young graduates. You know, I mean, people who are just done with NS, for example, mm. and, and people who are, who are in their final year or just graduating. The concern is not just what is immediately in front of them in terms of whether they can get a job, whether the job will earn enough for them to, you know, some of them want to set up their own family, but also in terms of their aspirations. Um, n not in a highfalutin sense of the word, but really in terms of, for example, I, I studied this mm -hmm. particular course, mm -hmm. or I really want to do this, but how much of that will have to be put aside for the time being while I focus on the immediate needs in front of me? And if I focus on the immediate needs in front of me, can I come back to this later on? Uh, um, so that, that's one of the points. And I mean, I think in terms of the restrictions, you know, um, I, I'm currently serving in Cheng San's Lita. It's a generally a very elderly community. And many of them, you know, tell me how they have been so happy to at least be able to go down, chipasa, you know, my tongsi isya, and, and come back home or, or at least see their, see their grandchildren again. Yeah. yeah. So while they're generally understanding, I think it's also about, the uh, other than the impacts on lives and livelihoods, it's also the impact on mental and emotional well-being. Yeah, and the well family ties, yeah. family, yes. family connections. I That's met right. one old lady who said she hasn't seen her grandchild. Yes. Yeah. I said, but now you can. And she said, yeah, but they are being very extra careful and they, they don't want to put me at risk. Indeed, mm -hmm. PM. Yesterday, I was just at the Bukit Kumba MRT. So one of my residents, she looks really young, very, very youthful, and she told me, Miss Lo, I'm promoted to be a grandmother. So her first grandchild, called Lucas, was born two months ago, exactly during Circuit Breaker. So you hasn't can, seen him yet? She hasn't seen, and she... she I told them on 
Yes, Skype. It's, it's just very different. And, <laughs> and babies grow and change every day, yeah. you know, yes. as parents we will know. So she was, you know, overjoyed with a lot of tears mm. when she showed me the pictures at yeah. the MRT station. She's very glad that yeah. she can it's see it's them every day. It's a great relief for the seniors to be able to yeah. go out. Yes. Uh, but I think many of them also want to do their Tai Chi and their brisk walking groups. And we have said, please have a care for now. The Tai Chi is okay if you are apart from one another. You can certainly brisk walk apart from one another. But it's the before and the after where you gather together for coffee and for chit chat. That's the dangerous part. So. Uh, we are still Very slowly, cautious. slowly, yeah, cautiously. Yeah. But anyway, it is starting. <laughs> I met one Tai Chi instructor and I said, how is it going? She said, well, we started the class and limited to 50 or something like that, properly spaced out. I said, make sure you don't mingle around before and after the class. She says, yes, I understand. Uh, but she was smiling when she said it, PM. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah. it, it's, an, it's an emotive need, right? People oh, want to connect. Human beings need to touch one another. Indeed, in, indeed. And, uh, Babies need to be he held. If you don't hug a baby, it grows up not quite right. Indeed. It's indeed. critical. Indeed. And, and, and yet we have to make that sacrifice during this period. So that's the difficult part for all of us. Yeah. Uh, you, PM, how, what's the, your sense of the sentiment around this election? I mean, it's... Is it are, are people in a anxious mood? I mean, are they are they are we are we engaging with them and reassuring them sufficiently? I, we have been doing it. No amount is enough, so we have to keep on doing it. I think people know that it's a grave situation. I'm not sure they quite understand what the danger is or why we are so worried about it. Uh, they feel that their jobs are impacted and maybe they may lose their jobs. They they know that there's COVID nineteen and we're doing all kinds of precautions. But what is it which we fear? Why are we so concerned for them? I think that's something which is hard to bring across because it's something we are trying to prevent happening and as long as I succeed in preventing it happening, they won't quite understand why they should be frightened. Indeed, <laughs> well, we, have, we have succeeded or we have been able to overcome crisis after crisis and sometimes people assume that it can automatically happen but it's through an immense effort to be able to overcome each crisis. It's, it's yes. like a duck floating on the water and mm. underneath paddling, paddling furiously, furiously away, paddling but furiously. seemingly very calm on the surface. Yeah, this is, this is the third election that, that I've been through, and I mean, so have both of us. Uh, it does feel different, but not what I entirely expected before the start. I mean, people are sort of grateful for some degree of contact and interaction and looking forward to speaking with you even with the mask on. Mm. I thought people would be fearful, but they are taking things No, they come forward. They come forward. They, they, they want to take pictures with you. They want to take selfies with you. We say, no, no, still social distance. Please have somebody take the picture for us. Mm. Sometimes I succeed, sometimes I don't. But they, I think the the recognition that this is an important choice and they want to express that choice is clearly there. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. But for Nadia, this is your first election. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Mm. So you don't have a preconceived notion of what uh, electoral campaign should be. But yeah. uh, I mean, I remember that uh, over the course of the first election, uh, day one and day eight felt very different. <laughs> <laughs> How has the journey been for you over the last few days? Uh, I mean, I, I've been very grateful, you know, to, to and, and I agree with what PM said about, you know, even though people are wearing the mask, they want to come and take photos of you, but more importantly, they, they really want to come forward and share their points with you. It's a, it, it, I don't know if it's because maybe you know, we came out of Circuit Breaker quite recently and there's a lot of things which are fresh in their minds, there's a lot of concerns and they're willing to express that and, and come up to us. So for me, I've really been very grateful to the residents who have been able, who, who are willing to share the tough stories, mm. which you know, are tough to say and some of them tough to hear. And for them to be so open and, and, and warm in, in sharing this with me, uh, and my team it is something which I've been very grateful for. Do you have a memorable story that you'd like to share with us or something that particularly influenced what you think you might uh, focus on or champion or a challenge you want to help people with it should we become elected as MPs? Yeah, yeah. I mean, th there's honestly been so many stories, you know, and especially because, like I mentioned earlier, Cheng San Slita is a very uh, elderly area. You know, there's, there's, there was one nenek who um, actually but when the volunteer went to the next door and, and knocked on it and said, oh, you know, the, the, the candidate is coming. And this nene actually pulled her stool to, to sit at the stoop with her, with her mask on. And it were, I, I was so grateful that someone was willing to share their stories with me, you know. And on another day, there was another well, What elderly. did she tell you? She just said that she was so happy to see someone and talk to her. Mm. She, she was alone. alone. Yeah. She was lonely. Living yeah. alone. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah there yeah. are many now, yeah. many, many in Ang Mokyo who That's are right. elderly and spouse has passed away. That's mm. right. And they are living alone at home and yeah. coping. Yeah. And I mean, okay, very quickly, I'll, I'll share two more. You know, in terms on the younger end of the spectrum, really, uh, in, in one of the private estates, you know, I had gone to a house and I moved on two houses down. And then suddenly this 15-year-old uh, girl, I remember that she was in Sec 3, she came running after me and she said, you know, Miss, Miss Nadia, may I ask you a question? I said, yes, please. And she said, what are some of your plans? Can you share them with me? Wow. Wow. You know, and, and, and you know, so I, I really wow. see when we talk about youth being apathetic, that, that is an old story. Mm. It, it really isn't the case this Good. time. And um, you, know, you so must enlist her, better enroll her yes, in your yes, youth did. group. Yes, yes, we, we, we did that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the last thing that I wanted to say, you know, is I really take heart from, from the volunteers and mm. from the residents. And sometimes, like I said, you know, when you hear these stories, it, it can be a lot. But there was this auntie who said to me, you know, she, she was talking to me about service and how grateful she was to be Singaporean. And at the end of it, she said, you know, my dear, have courage. Because the more that you do, the more strength you will have. And for me, that, that was just a reminder to just kind of like, okay, even when it's difficult, mm -hmm. just got to keep going. Yes. Well, that's a, mm -hmm. a very nice note. To, uh, <laughs> we, have to, we have to sort of remember those types of stories to inspire yeah. us going forward. But yeah. can I ask about young people, Nadia? You know, uh, do you have experience of what young people are concerned about? You talked about getting a job. Mm. Um, are there other fears and uh, concerns that they've put forward to you? Yeah, you know, Definitely, and I think because uh, some part of this election has been online as well, and we have definitely seen a number of residents who've been reaching out through direct messages and emails, and you know, I'm really sorry I haven't been able to reply every single one of them. It's been a very busy time on the ground. But uh, other than the immediate concerns, you know, youth are also... Very uh, idealistic. Yeah, and, and I have to say, well, I, I don't know if I'd use the word idealistic, but I would say, number one, that youth is a very diverse group. Okay, it's from the ages of 15 to 35 and that spans various life stages. For example, those who are studying may be concerned, should I continue studying? Do I get a job in the interim? Those who are in a job may think, oh, is this a time for me to try and get a new job? Do I stay here? And some of the older ones beyond that are also thinking, how do I start a family? How do I buy a home? So mm. number one, I'd make a point that the youth voice is a diverse one. And as a result of that, the hope for the future is also several mm. and varied. So you have youth who care about everything from you know, being able to be more participative in nation building. You have youth who are very concerned about sustainability. You have youth who want to look after their parents well. And, and beyond these short-term immediate concerns, our youth are very much you know, concerned about what, what's, what's next. What's the future for Singapore yeah. and how, how will they inherit and, and, and build it? Rightly so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you mentioned the word idealistic. It, it's okay for youth to be idealistic. No, I right? think you should I, I, be. Yeah, I, mean I mean, if you're not <laughs> idealistic when you're young, something is wrong. Oh, yeah, yeah. But you, I, we hope that as you grow, the ideals will mature, you'll understand what the limits are, and yet you'll still retain that drive and that sense of mission. We'd like mm. to make the world better. Yeah. And multiracialism in Singapore is one of the issues which is critical to us and which, for us, perpetually work in progress. Yeah, and, and PM, I, I, I was going to interrupt Nadia and suggest that the definition of youth be extended all the way up to 48 for self-serving reasons. <laughs> but, uh, but instead, um, if I could focus on some of the questions uh, that we're, we're getting online. And there's one um, here particularly which I think would resonate with uh, what you said about the internet part of this campaign, mm. which is this issue of the, um, the comments made by Raisa. Uh, the Workers' Party candidate and, and the follow-up from that, the, the comments online um, have uh, polarized, they've taken a sort of very polarized tone. Uh, I is that something that you've engaged with or you've received feedback on, Nadia? Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know. Um, but what I would say, you know, really on the topic is that for our generation, um, things like the race riots or, or, or kampong is a slightly further removed topic and when we think about it really our, our life number one our life experiences are different and number two our points of reference are different so youth today want to go beyond this concept of tolerance or racial harmony and they, they do they are willing to have uncomfortable conversations or conversations which may make some segment of the population feel uncomfortable and they're brave enough to do so and I think it's good that this kind of new norm is, is being forged. At the same time, you know, while we do 
over the years, we're quite used to this idea of having, um, you know, Western entertainment um, as part of our, our culture. It's also some of these ideals which are being spoken about now and because, you know, we grew up on the internet, it's understandable that this will come into our Singapore culture. And the question is, how do we then relate this back to our Singapore core and remember really what, what holds us together? Yeah. I think that's a very uh, reasonable exposition of a young person's point of view of a very complicated issue. Uh, the older people in Singapore, I think, have a somewhat different take on uh, the development of the Raisa case from the young people. And I think, as uh, Nadia says, it's because we have different life experiences, different points of reference, and therefore uh, we look at it differently. And I think we have to understand each other's point of view. The world has changed, attitudes have changed, younger people have a different perspective, and it's a perspective which uh, is valid and which uh, we have to take into account because young people will one day inherit Singapore and take over and be responsible for Singapore. And so what they think matters. But I'd like to put the perspective on the other side from somebody who's, uh, I suppose even Daniel's definition of youth may not reach me, <laughs> but uh, of how we have seen race and religion and language in Singapore for a long time. Sensitive matters, matters which can cause grave umbrage to be held very delicately and we must have great care. Doesn't mean that there's never a change. In fact, we discuss things now about race and religion, your dress, your school results, your differences in, uh, uh, um, in attitudes, whether there's a trade-off between the, the your racial identity or religious identity with a national one. Things which 20 years ago, I think we'd have been very uncomfortable to talk about. But now we talk about it more openly, but still sensitively. So as you go forward, I think more of these conversations can be, can be held and, uh, and people will be able to accept it better. But I would say not everything goes towards the more openness, because as Nadia says, you are uh, on the internet age, you pick up ideas from all over the world and things which never used to be sensitive in Singapore before now have become sensitive because they are sensitive in other countries. You cannot do this, it's offensive, you cannot do that. That's, that's cultural appropriation, there's some word. Do you know what it is? Uh, uh, you, you are taking, if I wear a chong sam and I'm not... Cultural, yeah, cultural appropriation. I, I'm, sorry, if, if you wear a Chinese dress, a Chinese will take offence. How dare you wear a Chinese dress? If I wear a Malay baju, how, how dare I wear a Malay baju? These are all you know, angst and anxieties from other societies imported to us because we are all on the same internet. And I think some of it is valid, but not all. And the old people's worries, some of them may be passé, not all. If you look around us in our region, the countries, where race, language and religion are still very live issues, very close to us. Can we divorce ourselves from those completely and say, well, we just treat each other completely uh, colorblind and the, the world outside is completely different. We try very hard, but we must always remember that it's sensitive. So that's, a, that's the view we have proceeded on, which has held tolerance and harmony, uh, not quite everything which the young people aspire to, but I think quite a considerable achievement. And if we want to go beyond that to do better, I think we should, but we should do it carefully and we should discuss this between the young ones and the older ones so that we, we get gradually a meeting of minds even though I don't think we will have completely an identity of views. And we have to accept that and go forward together. That's what OnePeople.sg is about. PM, <laughs> thank you for the <laughs> shout out. Thank you very much. Uh, we do, we, that is indeed what we're about. But may I put it to you like this, that, that there's some validity to the idealism and the aspirations of the youth that Nadia has expressed. I, I concede that completely. And there is some validity to the concerns of the elderly who have only seen trouble and strife. Uh, no, I wouldn't issue. say we have seen trouble and strife. We have seen trouble and strife and we have seen how we have built mm -hmm. harmony and a uh, good state of affairs from that after a lot of years of hard work. And we want to improve it 
but we don't want to put it at risk. You don't want to risk that hard work. I don't want progress. to put it at risk. I want to go better, but at the same time, I must know where the limits are and proceed carefully. And for a meeting of minds then, it cannot be that one convinces the other completely. It's we must move together. I old think and it young is very difficult to convince one another completely. Every yeah. generation has yeah. got different uh, life experiences, different reference points. My reference points are in the 1960s, going into 1959 when we had the first election as a very young kid, then the going into Malaysia, which was a big um, um, political thing. The whole country was in great excitement and then coming out from Malaysia including race riots in the middle. My parents lived through that. In fact, the, the, my parents' generations participated actively in that. We were just growing up then. They were growing up, my parents, during the time of the Japanese occupation and after. And for them, those are formative experiences and as we were growing up, they would often tell us how tough things were and how much that influenced their outlook on life. And I think we understood some of it, but not all because we were not even born then. Our children, the millennials, uh, they learn about it in the history books. We try and tell them what, my, I try and tell them what my parents told me. But at second telling, is not the same. So their reference points are different. And therefore, their perspectives will be different from mine. And I think we have to accept that. And we have to find a reasonable way forward for everybody. Together. Together, indeed. Uh, PM, colleagues, we're about halfway through. It's uh, getting on for 10 o'clock. And I think what we should focus on then is really maybe the key issues that we've addressed that our residents have brought up in this electoral campaign. And I think maybe it comes down to uh, three key issues that are at the top of people's minds. The, the COVID-19 response, uh, how things have gone, um, and how we might chart a way forward. Mm -hmm. um, what this has meant for the elections itself, and, yes. and the fact that we've called this election, uh, and uh, that we have voting in a couple of days, and then thirdly, the opportunities that we hope to create uh, coming out of the economic yes. challenges that yes. we're facing uh, currently. So th I would suggest we maybe focus the second half uh, largely on those uh, three uh, key issues. Um, I, I think perhaps we begin with jobs. Uh, certainly in my walkabouts and the meeting my residents, I actually that was the key issue that people brought up. Yeah. Uh, and I know Yenling, you've uh, had quite a lot of uh, uh, direct work with this before COVID in terms of uh, the, the work of jobs, skilling. Right, because she's in mom. Of course. Mm. <laughs> as well as MOE. As well as MOE. Me. So she's as well on both as the sides CDC, of this. Yes. yes. You're, you're, you're looking at it from all the different angles. Yes. Um, how, how do you sort of frame this issue for your residents when, they, when all that they're worried about is their next job? Mm. Uh, what's your response to them? I mean, how do, you, how do you tell them about the various issues around their next job? Right. Well, in the last few weeks, as uh, I interacted with my residents, um, really, job security and stability came out as the key issue. Even if my residents don't verbalize it, it's actually pretty palpable. That the anxiety is pretty palpable. Uh, whether or not both parents are working in the family or sole breadwinner, uh, I think it keeps them, um, you know, quite concerned and quite anxious. Yesterday was a very particularly gratifying day. I was doing house visit at one of my new PTO estate, Kate Hong Axis. And uh, I've been having this email exchange with this gentleman and I sought his approval to use his story to inspire fellow Singaporeans. This Mr. So are you. I met him um, as soon as I reached the estate. He just came back and I saw him wearing an SG Clean t-shirt. And when I, we were exchanging email, I knew he was working as a chef. So I said, when did you join SG Clean? And then after that, um, we had a brief chat. And we also caught up when I went to his unit for house visit. So he has always been one of the chef in Hotel Gen. Mm -hmm. Hotel Gen. And of course, we know that the tourism industry has mm -hmm. been um, badly hit by COVID-19 outbreak. So as part of the um, facilitation by MAM, by Workforce Singapore, um, the hotel sectors helped to redeploy some of the workers. So he was a chef who was now He was moved, one of the chefs and then he's been Clean. appointed as an SG Clean ambassador. Oh, so good. actually it's a good job because then he gets to meet other fellow chefs, for example, mm -hmm. in a hawker centre, mm -hmm. in a food court, sharing with them the importance of maintaining public mm -hmm. hygiene and personal mm -hmm. hygiene. But did he think of this as a good idea or was he... What was his he was sentiment having transferred from being he a chef? He was very excited because um, for the longest time he was always uh, in the kitchen, of course, enjoying his job. 
but now it allows him to really expand his uh, horizon, stepping out there to share and advocate the importance of maintaining public uh, hygiene and also personal hygiene. Mm -hmm. um, I could feel that excitement and more importantly, I could sense that peace of mind. Mm. Sense that peace of mind. I, I thought that was uh, really reassuring and that really helps me to bring my MOM, MOE or even CDC's work um, to life. The, you know, the numbers that we see, whether it's SG, United, Skills, Jobs and Skills, 100,000 opportunities, Mr. So are you is one of the beneficiary, yeah. Yeah, one of the job creators, right. and we hope to be able to benefit more fellow Singaporeans. And yeah. Yeah. but that type of approach, it's not going to uh, uh, create that same sense of of, of calm and, and hope for some of the examples that we talked about earlier, NTU fresh graduate uh, people who are still in their studies, right? I mean, they're looking for a very different type of opportunity. Yes. We've got other schemes yeah. too for the fresh graduates. We've got internship okay. schemes. We've got schemes to encourage companies to take on people on a temporary basis and others to take on people permanently but with a subsidy for several months so that you get the person started working rather than standing around and after six months or a year, he's not only partially forgotten what he learned at university or polytechnic but uh, has become no longer quite in the groove and when he goes in a year's time, he'll be competing against somebody 12 months younger than him, mm -hmm. the next batch graduating, and he may not be at an advantage. So to get him started and grooved into the workforce and tied over this period, and I think we have a lot of schemes to do that in the, in the four budgets, um, and uh, we want to create uh, 100,000 places yes. altogether, jobs yes. as well as training places. Indeed. Uh, it will take a lot of effort, but we will put ourselves to it. And we put Taman in charge, and he is pulling all the pieces together. Yeah, the, the the types of jobs that we create are also some of the questions that people are asking us. Uh, and I yeah. had a number of questions about um, tech-related jobs and IT-related yes. jobs, yes. particularly, you know, if they're all going to be tech and IT type jobs, can I do them? No, they won't all be tech and IT jobs because one of the things now is that you'll need a lot more service jobs yes. mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you're you're going to have to manage. COVID-19 for a long time and how are we going to do that? Yeah. The testing, the, the organization of the testing, yeah. the, the management of the people, making sure of the safe distancing, taking care of the cases who may be ill and the cases who need to be quarantined, the cases, cases who need to be SHN. It's a massive operation. Yeah. Just this last few months, we must be few tens of thousands of people yes. who are, yeah, who've been brought indeed. in to organize indeed. the testing, the, yes. the, the managing. Yeah. It, it's a whole operation because people see the only the front end, the testing itself and the tracing, but you've got testing, you've got tracing, you've mobilized a whole group of people to do swabbing, you've got laboratory set up, you need technicians in the labs, you need people in the healthcare system to take care of many patients. So it's quite a massive system that we've put in place. And there will be jobs there. That's right. Just dealing with COVID operations, which we expect to continue for quite some time. So to yep. be clear, that there's going to be some of those jobs which are temporary. We, we're getting things going. But actually what you're describing is that a, a, the, a big part of yeah. that is, is an increase in capability and future-proofing, as That's Nadia has put right. it. That's right. And th so these are, these are sort of real jobs for yep. the, the, the long term. The long well, term. we have to run in a different way. I mean, you look at the, f the, the migrant workers. We used to run on a lean ship. Mm and therefore the costs were kept down and therefore houses cost less and you can get things done quickly. But now, if we are going to be in a COVID environment, you cannot operate like that anymore because it will be very dangerous in a COVID environment. And you need to put in precautions, you need to put in extra safeguards, you need extra overhead for cleaning, for separation, for supervision, for guidance. And that's a huge business. Absolutely. And therefore, there will be a lot of uh, work involved making sure that it happens properly in order to keep us safe. It's expensive, yes, but if I didn't do that and I have an outbreak and I must lock down the economy again, I think it's even more expensive. So these are things which we have to adjust as we go along. What are the opportunities which are there? Let's take the readily available ones and let's create new ones. Mm. And the new ones will come from new investments. So the other day I showed this picture, who will be crazy enough to invest in Singapore in a recession? This was one recession very long ago. But today we are still getting people who are crazy enough to invest in Singapore in a recession. 
because they have faith in us. And therefore, there will be jobs, thousands of new good jobs for our people when they come out from work or when they lose other jobs to go into the new ones. And I think we want to keep that reputation, mm. that standing, that credibility, that sense that this is a special place. They know what their livelihoods depend on. And in a crisis, we know how to hang together so that we will come through successfully. Thank you, PM. That's uh, certainly uh, a, a big part of the work going forward. Yes. And uh, it, it's it, it, it COVID and jobs, those are the two big yes. things. Indeed. Yeah. And I mean, if I can, if I can chime in, you know, I, one thing that I did want to say is COVID-19, this is an often used phrase, but the, it's true that COVID-19 has affected people from all walks of life and for all backgrounds. And while we have all these schemes rolling out, one thing that I really wanted to put across is that you may not, some Singaporeans may not be used to looking out for these schemes, for seeing, oh, where's the nearest job fair, or which number should I call, you know. I think that be during this time, it's an extraordinary, unprecedented time. Singaporeans must feel and must be willing to reach out and to, uh, and to, and to look for these schemes actively and to, to seek help in, in this way. But we will help them to seek help. That's right. Well, that's right. Nadia, yeah. I must tell you that yeah. uh, just a few weeks back, um, Josephine already announced mm -hmm. that we are bringing the jobs to you in the heartland yeah. and yeah. eight, 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 they're up already. Yes. They're up, eight of them are already You're getting up, one of them. Right, Amokyo, right? right? Bukit Pato, etc. And mm -hmm. even Sengkang, etc. Right. In time yeah. to come, there will be a satellite career centre in each heartland yeah. where, you know, you can, it's really at the doorstep. Yeah. Better still, two days ago, I saw that Workforce Singapore move out the truck. So they're bringing the truck to you just in case that you find that the satellite centre is a bit far. Yeah. 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 No, indeed, indeed. So, um, Jobs and COVID, uh, you, you, the, the, the thing that's a little bit in between is that sense of uh, engagement with the rest of society, right? I mean, that's why many of these jobs are, are being restricted. The, all these activities that yes, we can't yes. get done. Uh, and we don't know if they're going to be temporary. We don't know if they're going to be permanent. And, and that's been the reason why COVID has impacted upon yes. jobs. The, the uncertainty. The, the uncertainty. And, and the question arises from that, this activity that we're in, right at the moment. And people have asked me qu questions about the election, uh, the electoral process. Yeah. Um, you know, is it, is it okay if I don't vote? If I, is it okay yes. if, I, if I take my grandmother down uh, to, to have help her? The, the, the process feels different. The anxiety around the elections feels different. Uh, may I start with uh, Minister Wong and, and the, the, the view from the task force. Mm. Uh, you know, this, this whole thing of the work that we've been doing on COVID-19 and uh, the people and the press have been expecting an election for some time and I, it must have been weighing on your minds as you were, were, were dealing with COVID. Every press conference I get asked this question and I tell the reporters it's not relevant to the work of the task force. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, the task force sets national guidelines. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Right? We look at the overall picture, we prioritise like, you know, public health and safety of every Singaporean and so when we were in the circuit breaker it was a very tight position. You know, there was a lot of pressure for us to open up very quickly. And we were very cautious. We, dis we didn't want to open the floodgates. We went in um, in phases, starting with phase one. And then when we decided, we monitored the situation and we felt that the situation was remained stable after phase one, uh, we went into phase two. Uh, so that was, and then within each phase, there are national guidelines around what sorts of activities can be allowed within mm. that phase. Indeed. That was where the task force came from. So, we, so looked, then we looked at the national picture. Yeah. So then PM, you, you made the decision to call the election as one of these yes. activities within yes. this, this yes. framework that yeah. the task force has it, set up. It's a major decision. I explained it when I uh, advised the president to dissolve parliament and issue the writ and I made a broadcast to explain why I was doing it then. And first, I had to make sure that it was safe to do safe for people to conduct the campaign, safe for people to vote, and safe also for people to focus their minds, voters to focus their minds and think about what the election is about. And so overall, the country has to be in a reasonably stable situation, that not completely normal yet, but enough for people to be, sit down and say, now I have to spend the next couple of weeks get this thing done because I need to get this thing out of the way. 
which is the general election. And looking at the trends after the circuit breaker, after it opened up phase one, phase two, I was satisfied that it looks stable enough for us to be able to do it safely. And also I was satisfied, in fact I was very worried about this, that we did want to get this thing out of the way quickly because after that I do not know what is going to be down the road over the next 12, 18 two months, two years. And there are many uncertainties and very likely many difficult spots to come. And therefore decisions which have to be taken, actions which have to be uh, dealt with very, very rapidly. And mm. it's best that we have got this done and you've got a team in place which is going to be able to deal with that with the full support of the population who elected you knowing that you're going into a very tough spot. And so weighing all these things up, thinking it over carefully, I decided we could proceed. And so far, touch wood, I think the COVID situation has remained stable and the elections have been able to continue and we will be able to vote safely and old folks, we are making special arrangements for them. Mm. The very old ones, I think 8 to 10 o'clock in the morning, the old but not quite so old ones like me, I've got my notice 10 to 12 o'clock in the morning. So I, uh, the arrangements will be made and I think you can vote with confidence. The PM, you continue to remain worried about these issues. I'm very oh. worried. I've been very worried right from the very beginning. I'm very worried because our population is elderly. We've got many, many old people now, one in six, one in seven, who are 65 and above. And if you look at the other countries where the COVID situation has burst forth and gone out of control, the casualties amongst the old people are very high. Uh, five, 10 percent is for the very old ones. So if it ever bursts forth into our whole wider community and you have that happen to us, we would be in very serious trouble. You look at Lee Amoy home. We had mm. just 15 cases, I think. Yeah. And four deaths. So it's not a laughing matter. I mean, we have had many, many cases in the dorms, very few fatalities, because those are young men fit. And therefore, they mostly get it lightly. And then hopefully they're okay. And even then a couple have died. But if it gets into my community, I think they'll be held to pay. And that's why right from the beginning, I told the Minister of Health, don't let this grow. The other countries were saying, I will flatten the curve. Let's let people get sick, doesn't matter. Take it over time. They all get sick, they all get well. Things will be fine and then we'll be immune. I said, don't, don't take that chance. Mm. Protect our people. This comes first before the economy. Mm. And that's why when the MTF recommended to go for a circuit breaker and it was ambivalent because you have to move before it is not before it becomes unambiguous you have to move when it's just starting to pick up and the signs are not clear we discussed it in cabinet and we decided to move i think just as well but we are very worried because as lawrence says you look at melbourne you look at israel you look at the other countries where it's bursting forth again even texans the most macho men in the world are now going to be advised to wear masks by their governor because it's serious. So you can imagine a 10 gallon hat and wearing a mask. Cowboy. But a very, a very serious matter. A very serious matter. It's not worry. a laughing matter at all. So, so, PM, we talked about the worry that we continue to have about jobs yes. and the, the plans that, that we have from the young graduates to the mid careers. Uh, people who have been in the same job for some time shooting yes. them. So now we have this other worry about COVID and where yes. this is going to, to go both as a disease as well its impact on our economy. Yes. So perhaps then we can we can pivot to, to Minister Wong. Lawrence, uh, the task force has been at this for some time. Mm -hmm. you, you, we've, we've had a number of measures in place. You've talked about ramping up capacity, capability, uh, technology. Where are we going with COVID-19? What is our plan for dealing with this for our country? The key for us, Janil, is to be able to continue to control the infection while we progressively allow activities to resume safely. 
that's not easy to do, but over the last few months, uh, particularly during the circuit breaker, we have stepped up significantly our capacity for testing and tracing. So now we are able to move in very quickly the minute we identify a case, we cast a wide net around that confirmed case, we quickly isolate all of the suspect cases and close contacts, partly through technology, trace together, but it's also through the skill of our contact tracers and the army of contact tracers that we have assembled and put together. And then we test all of them so that if any of these close contacts are tested positive, we can again repeat the cycle of quarantine, isolation and testing. So it means a huge operations to go out, make sure that every time we identify a case, we are able to quickly go in, ring fence, isolate these people and prevent the cases from spreading. This is a capability that we now have and we are in full mode operations. But I think it's also very critical that Singaporeans do not be complacent. Do not assume that we have this capability and therefore we can all go out and celebrate and have big parties. If we take that attitude, no amount of testing and tracing will save us. All of us must do our part, remain very disciplined and vigilant, adopt a new mindset. We cannot go back to life before the circuit breaker. We are all in a new normal and we have to do our part together in order to control the effect, uh, infection while we resume activities. That's how we can sustain this going forward. And even then, it is not certain. That's right. It can happen. It's happened to many other countries and we must be psychologically prepared. It could happen to us. But we will do our damnness to prevent it from happening and if it does come back, we will deal with it. This, it's, it's a serious national effort, pulling together every part of our public systems and it's our people. And it's, the it's, it's, it's our whole country mobilized. Yes. Uh, the evidence, what's happening around the world uh, uh, is worrying. It gives us good reasons to take this posture. It gives us good reasons to invest in, in these capabilities. But do we have reasons to be hopeful? Do we have reasons to believe that there are things that we can do to deal with this that so far hasn't been demonstrated? Well, to me, the confidence I get is, like I said, when we started this conversation, the spirit of our people in responding to the crisis this past six months. The fact that people have come together, they have mobilized, volunteers have stepped forward. Lots of innovation happening on the ground. It's yeah. not just people doing the things they are told to do. Yeah. You know, using technology, yes. robots, trying out new ways of doing things with telemedicine, remote um, vital signs monitoring systems that they are deploying in the dormitories and in the community care facilities. So that whole spirit of Singapore United, that gives me confidence that yeah. we can pull it off. And we've made enormous progress. Today, what we are capable of doing did not exist six months ago. Oh. Mm. That, I mean, the numbers of tests we can do, the organization to manage the dormitories, the organization to do contact tracing quickly on a big scale, the databases pulled together from many different ministries in order to get the information immediately you want, and the whole information structure. Every day I look at the list in the evening. We all do, Pierre. And <laughs> then I, within an hour I'm asking them, what about this case? Please tell me, where did this come from? What is the connection? Wh wh where? How? What have you done about it? And I think to be able to build all that up within six months, and we're not done because we're continuing to build up, shows the amount of effort which has gone in and the results which we have, the, the capability which we have developed, and the focus which we must maintain if we are going to stay safe. Because that is what enables us to open up safely, together with people cooperating, wearing masks, safe distancing, washing their hands, and not doing reckless things. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. So, uh, PM colleagues, we are rapidly running out of time. Uh, it's uh, 20 past 10. So I think we need to move towards uh, wrapping up and having a few final comments. Uh, to the people who've been watching us online and who've uh, been making comments. I'm sorry we can't answer every single question. I know there were a number on CPF and housing, uh, education, special needs, all of which are important. But we thought today 
uh, we'd focus on some of those issues that our residents had brought up to us and that we think really are at the heart of what this election is about. So we will return to these issues and these ideas uh, in a variety of other formats and a variety of other occasions. But I'm going to ask my colleagues and finally PM to give their, their closing remarks. The, the, what does this election and today's rally mean to them going forward? I'm going to, I'm going to start with Nadia and then we'll have uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Lo Yen Ling and then uh, <coughs> Mr. Lawrence Wong um, and then finally PM. Uh, uh, somewhere in between I might sneak in a comment or two. Uh, so I'm going to turn to Ms. Nadia Samdin. First election for you. Uh, you've walked the ground, you've had online engagements, you've met hundreds of people, possibly thousands of people. Thousands, and now thousands. here we are, the last night of the campaign yeah. at our GE 2020 rally. Yeah. Give us a closing closing remark. It's it's very surreal, you know, and but one thing that I will say is, you know, as a result of walking on the ground, whether it's in our HDB estates, in our private estates or even online in this space. Um, I believe in Singaporeans. I think that's one thing which COVID-19 has really shown. Whether it's our seniors who have been willing to pick up Zoom, you know, some of our, some of our volunteers, uh, that's how they could join in the meetings when, when they were at home during Circuit Breaker. And uh, they also share, you know, how it's not just meetings on Zoom, but also how they teach their kids how to cook things on Zoom. Um, to, to our parents, you know, whether it's those who had to balance between work from home, those who had to look after kids on home-based learning, the, the, resilien the resilience and the grit which Singaporeans have demonstrated during this time um, has, has really given me a lot of heart. Mm. And, and as for youth, you know, as I've said earlier, you know, we're, we're not the apathetic ones. And I'm very proud of the active participation of our youth in, in this GE. Um, there's a difference between information and knowledge. Information in terms of what is, what is out there, and you know, there's so much online. But it's also about knowledge, which is connecting the dots and forming informed opinions. And I think our youth, our, our youth are capable of that. And, and I'm very proud. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Yenling. Thank Your you. last thoughts in this GE 2020 rally. Thank you, Janil. I think we talked a lot about jobs and, and indeed over the past two weeks, jobs and COVID-19 really came up in every conversation I had with residents. Earlier on, Minister Lawrence talked about uh, the fresh graduates expressing concern and anxiety about their first job. PM talked about uh, the scheme that's specially designed for them and that is the SG United Traineeship Program. I just wanted to cite that as an example. When it was announced just two, three months back, it was meant to be a program with only about 8,000 traineeship positions. But we went out to recruit the companies and the companies responded uh, heartily. And now we have close to a thousand companies on board, uh, extending, prepared to extend traineeship positions to our fresh graduates, to our recent graduates. I use this example to show that it really uh, takes the whole of society to come together, to rally together, to overcome COVID-19 and we will spare no effort to sustain and save jobs and livelihood. We will spare no efforts to create new jobs and traineeship positions as well as skills training opportunities for fellow Singaporeans so that not only the fresh graduates will, will have peace of mind but also meet career hires and we will have more example of Mr. So are you. All will have peace of mind to provide uh, for their family, come what may. And now more than ever, our lives, our jobs, our future are at stake. So let us work with you and work for you and overcome the storm together to secure a better future for you and your family. Thank you, Yan Ling. Lawrence, this, you must be in a very unique position. Uh, you must be in a unique position uh, to do this, uh, fight the campaign, deal with COVID. Uh, I'm not asking for tears. I'm asking for your last comments in this GE 2020 rally. Well. Janil, I would say that uh, we've been fighting this virus for the past six months and during that period, we have truly seen the best of Singapore and Singaporeans at work. But we all know that the fight is far from over. In fact, it is still, there is still a long way to go, be it fighting the virus or securing our economic future, securing jobs, securing livelihoods for all Singaporeans. So that same spirit of unity coming together that we have seen in the past six months, that's what 
will allow us to overcome this crisis together. And that's why this, important is, this election is so important because there are high stakes and our survival and our future is on the line. And so we really hope Singaporeans will consider this very carefully and allow us through this election to unite together, to come together as a country and to overcome this crisis of a generation. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you very much. Uh, just before I go to our Prime Minister Lee Sien Lung with his closing remarks, I just want to say thank you all very much for watching us, for uh, giving your comments, and over the last days of the campaign for opening your doors and answering our knocks and taking our leaflets and asking us these difficult and important questions about the future of our country and your families and your jobs and your giving us an opportunity to engage with your concerns. I'm Janal Puducherry and I've been joined today by my colleagues and comrades Nadia Samdin, Lawrence Wong and Lo Yen Ling. And so closing out our GE 2020 rally, could I ask for our closing remarks from PM Lee Sin Lung? This is a very unusual closing rally for a general election campaign. Normally it's a moment of high emotion, you're rousing everybody to fever pitch, getting them ready to do battle and vote on nomination on election day, on polling day. But this one, we are discussing soberly, seriously, calmly, issues, priorities, challenges, solutions. What does the country face? What can we do? How should we do it together? And I think it is appropriate in this moment that we should be in this frame of mind. Serious, collected, a little bit detached, but we know that this is a serious problem and let's make the most rational, sensible thing we can do to get through. And what is the question? The question is, we are going to face a very difficult time over the next couple of years and we have to deal with COVID-19, we have to get jobs. And how can we get the strongest team to be given the mandate to be looking after Singapore and working with you to see you through this and make sure that after this that Singapore has a bright future and all the hopes and dreams which we have had for our kids and grandkids and that we have talked about and planned and prepared for will come to pass not by itself but because of our efforts together. So if this evening we have helped you to understand better, to feel better why we are worried about certain things, why we are confident about certain things, why we want to do things with you, then I think the hour you've spent with us will have been well worth it and will pay you back many times over when you vote and in the years to come. Thank you very much and good night.